Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Gary Gerber from the Power Practice and Treehouse Eyes. Welcome to tonight's webinar where you're gonna hear some great content from three world-renowned experts, myopia management, keratoconus, and some other really fascinating topics. It's an interesting time to attend a webinar like this in the middle of a uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And what I mean by that is with my practice building head on and my Treehouse Eyes experience, Now's a really good time to plan to reopen your practice with a really big bang. And you're gonna have some content tonight. I'm sure you're gonna learn a lot of new things that if you sit down, digest, take a lot of notes, you'll be able to use when you do go back to reopen. So a good way to use some of that free time instead of uh, binge, uh, binging on Netflix, you can take some of the content that you're gonna learn tonight and start to either you can start your own specialty practice or you can do what you're already doing and just do more of it. Uh, I'm gonna introduce each of our presenters before their session. And if you have questions, all you need to do is type them into the chat box over to the side. Um, it'd be helpful if you said, I have a question for uh, a Dr. Jedlica or Gellies or Myler, that would help us a little bit, but we'll, we'll kind of vamp around and we can send it out to whoever and we're going to save the questions till the end but definitely as they come up and they pop into your head just put them into the chat room so we're going to get started right away i'm uh, going to introduce dr jason jedlica he's an associate professor and chief of the cornea and contact lens service at indiana university school of optometry he's a fellow and past president of the scleral lens education society and a diplomat in the american academy of optometry cornea contact lens and refractive technology section Jason, take it away, it's all yours. Thank you, Gary, I appreciate it. Um, welcome everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and be a part of this great panel. And um, just hope that we can bring you some good stuff tonight to go over. Um, my session that I'm tasked with tonight is talking about axial length and myopia management. And um, as we were talking before our the webinar tonight, um, Dr. Mahler was kind of concerned about my slides being uh, full of data. So uh, I promise to keep it interesting. And I know that um, Dr. Gellies has a mountain of slides to cover, so we'll make it quick too. So, you know, myopia control is quickly become, you know, as hot a topic as there is in eye care. Um, for a long time, especially with specialty contact lenses, ortho -K existed, you know, people would talk about myopia control with soft lenses, atropine, et cetera, but it was still about sclerals and whatnot. But if you look at the webinars that are being offered right now and the emails that are coming to your inbox offering you educational opportunities during this crisis, I mean, it's myopia control as much as anything. So I want to talk a little bit about that and specifically I want to talk about the role of measuring axial length in this process. So why do we wanna control myopia? Why do we even care? You realize that the biggest reason is um, the ocular health risks that are associated with myopia or so we believe. Um, just gonna go through a few points here to talk about. This is just data for anybody who doesn't already know this or believe this. Um, we know that the risk of myopic maculopathy, for example, goes up significantly with increase in myopia. Um, you can look at the numbers again. I don't want to go through all the data because I don't want people to get bored with going through data. But uh, again, it's pretty clear by looking at this graph, the risk of myopic degeneration increases, of course, with increasing myopia. Um, again, what else do we know? We know that the risk of retinal detachment goes up at pretty much the same rate as myopic maculopathy. Um, as we go up in prescription, the risk of um, our odds ratio goes up significantly. And so, you know, we don't want people becoming high myops because the risk of retinal detachment is one thing. One possible complication is certainly there. Um, there's also been studies that show this association between myopia and glaucoma, and not just high myopia, but even low myopia and moderate myopia. Um, as the prescription goes up again, even starting in the low range, increased risk of myopia does occur. Um, and the again, the, the risk is two to three times greater for myopes in general, and more so for moderate to higher myopes. So, um, you know, when you put all of the potential risk factors together, for ocular health as it pertains to an increasingly myopic eye, um, you can see that the, the 
if you really want to dive into this, basically what this is showing you is by axial length or by prescription on the right side, what are the risks of ocular health if you combine all risks? And you can see as you go up in prescription, that risk factor goes up significantly, um, up to 100% increased risk compared to no risk in the highest of prescriptions. So again, this is why myopia control is a concern. This is what we believe that by limiting progression of myopia, we will limit the change to the health of the eye and we will reduce the risk of these potential complications. However, let's be really clear, the risks we're talking about aren't really associated with myopia per se, they're associated with increasing axial length. Now, you might say, well, isn't that kind of the same thing? And that is true to an extent that increasing axial length yields increasing myopia, but it's not necessarily the reverse. It is possible, of course, that a cornea could become increasingly steep, like with someone with keratoconus, for example, and they could become increasingly myopic as well, but they would not have the associated retinal risks. So when we, when we talk about myopia control, let's be clear, what we're really talking about is axial length control. It's just easier for us to talk about it and visualize it with patients and, and amongst ourselves in, in many ways if we talk about it in terms of the myopic prescription rather than the axial length, because what does that really mean? It's easier to talk about myopia. And they are, again, intimately interwoven. Increasing myopia is almost always due to increasing axial length, but um, progression of myopia and progression of axial length aren't necessarily one-to-one. -one. So again, let's, let's understand some risk here and think about this a little bit. And, and the reason I bring this into play is ultimately what we're talking about is the importance of knowing and measuring axial length for these, these patients. Um, it's entirely possible that you could have two patients in your practice that are both one diopter myopes. And one of them could have keratometric readings of around 46 diopters and an axial length of 23 millimeters. Another one could have Ks of 40 and an axial length of 26. Which of these patients is more at risk for axial length related complications and which one requires more aggressive intervention for controlling the progression? Again, it comes down to the axial length. And if you don't measure it, then you can't assess the true risk. Now you could say that, well, if I knew the prescription and I knew the corneal curvature, I could kind of figure out the axial length and I'll give you that. But again, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's other factors like the location of the crystalline lens within the eye and whatnot that will also impact things. And so you really, if you're going to be a true myopia manager, and, and as I'm trying to get you to think now, an axial length manager, um, you have to be able to measure it and you have to be able to monitor it. And that requires having instrumentation that does measure axial length. So if we, if we want to control myopia, control axial length growth, but we don't have instrumentation for measuring it, we might say, well, I'll just, I'll just monitor and measure refractive error and I'll use controlling refractive error as my guide. And the problem is, with that is most studies show that it's not that precise to measure refractive error on children. Even in a group of adults or teens and up where we're not dealing with the accommodative abilities of a six, eight, 10 year old, um, we can still have a, a half diopter to a diopter of range between one doctor's refraction and another doctor's refraction within the same practice or on a different day, and there's variables. And even if we cycloplege, our endpoints are not that precise because generally speaking, we're measuring in quarter diopter increments. So if you're really monitoring for progression and you're using refractive error as your basis, it's challenging, especially if you're doing ortho K because you are changing corneal shape and it becomes more difficult to get really good endpoints. When we compare that to using axial length as a measure of progression, um, our, our numbers, depending upon which unit you use, there's, there's several types of biometers that are non-contact. And I'm not even gonna talk about applination, um, A-scan or water immersion A-scan, because it's just, it's just not very practical on children. Um, and so 
or, or it's not very accurate in the case of Applination A scan. But in terms of non contact biometry, we're talking about partial coherence interferometry, low coherence interferometry, or swept source coherence tomography. Our, our precision range for measuring is down into the range of about um, 30 microns. Uh, so we're talking about 0.03 millimeters. And when we compare that to our, our ability to estimate uh, refractive error changes, um, we can see that axial length measurement using non-contact biometry is at least five times more sensitive and accurate than using refractive error as our basis. So again, if we want to talk to our patients and their families about controlling axial length growth, which is really what this is about, but we're not measuring it, we're really not able to be very precise and we're not able to um, give those patients the best data to know. So I have some other thoughts on axial length and, and I just wanted to kind of summarize the last bit that we talked through. And that again is, is that axial length is really what we're trying to control when we're talking about myopia control, because that's where the risk factor for ocular health comes in. To not measure it um, is not providing the highest level of care in myopia control. And so that part up to this point is me advocating to you the value and the importance of axial length measurements with non-contact biometry as the true standard for being able to monitor for progression of myopia and the associated axial length changes and risks. So again, the next little bit here, I just wanna to talk to you a few other thoughts on axial length. Um, you know, when you, when you, an eye is like a balloon, okay? And, and so some of this stuff, maybe we haven't thought too much about, but um, the research is there for sure. Um, when we accommodate, what's really happening when our, our eyes accommodate is our, our ciliary muscles contracting. Um, it does physically change the size of your eye. It does elongate the eye ever so slightly when we accommodate, okay? And, and studies have shown that with accommodative stimuli, um, you can get, you know, 12 to 20 micron differences or increased axial length measurements. And so why do I bring this up? If you're going to use axial length measurements in your practice as your gold standard for monitoring for progression, again, of axial length and myopia, I would have you consider doing it under cycloplegia when you do it. Um, it doesn't need to be done at every appointment, at every visit, but um, having been to China and seeing how some of the large scale myopia control clinics work there, um, they do a complete annual evaluation at least if not every six months. And at those appointments where you're monitoring for progression, again, I would advocate that it is all done under identical circumstances every time. And one of those is, um, considering a cycloplegia. And again, in this case, simply um, two drops of 1% trypicamide five minutes apart is adequate to reduce the risk of this accommodative stimuli and changes because again, we're dealing with six, eight, 10 year olds. Um, it may be hard to control their accommodation when they're looking into a biometer. Another interesting thing that comes back again to axial length is what happens when we initiate therapy of atropine. The chart in front of you, there's, this is just evidence to, to speak to. Um, the take home out of this chart is that when we start patients on atropine, sometimes we can actually see a shortening of axial length in the immediate period after starting therapy. And certainly in my situation, um, I've seen on many occasions, in fact, most occasions when I start atropine therapy, that when they come back for their initial follow-up, I often refract a quarter less minus. Um, and so recognize the fact that if atropine therapy is going to be part of your program for a patient for controlling myopia and axial length change, I highly advocate checking again their axial length at an appointment shortly after starting atropine therapy and recognizing that that may be a new starting point for progression. Now you do have to consider that when, if and when the time comes that they wash out, that you may get an extra bump in change in prescription. 
Um, but again, when you're on atropine, if you're going to monitor for change on atropine, it needs to be comparing atropine treated visits to atropine treated visits. And so again, having the um, axial link measurements is really important, I think, um, and having them before and after you start the therapy and not being surprised if you see a slight change because again, as I showed you with the balloon, when you relax accommodation, the eye will lengthen or will shorten, sorry, when you relax accommodation, the eye will actually shorten ever so slightly because that ciliary muscle tone goes away and that allows the eye to not be stretched by that ciliary muscle tone. All right, one last thought as it pertains to um, axial length and managing. There, there is definitely a diurnal variation of IOP. We all know that. And there's also a diurnal variation on axial length. As I increase intraocular pressure, my axial length absolutely changes. And again, if you don't believe it, there's plenty of information in the peer-reviewed literature that shows that axial length change can vary by, again, about 0.04 millimeters um, from the low to the high point of the day. And if you look and if you plot this out, it absolutely follows the diurnal variation of IOP. So what's the take home there? The take home there, again, I would suggest is that it's important to try to measure these patients' axial length measurements, if you really want to be precise, at roughly the same appointment time. So if a patient's going to come in at 2 p.m. for their annual checkup, it would be wise and best level of care to have that patient coming in around that same time of day each year for their annual checkup when you do their axial length measurements. One other interesting thought that I have for you is, is just like we, with glaucoma management, a lot of time we set target pressures that we say, well, this is my goal. And, and there's a lot of research out there now that shows given a child's age and K readings and prescription and axial length that you can, you can chart out normal progression and you can chart out expected progression if you institute certain types of therapy. And I think that it would be wise for us to consider starting setting target axial length goals for our patients when we begin myopia control therapy, whether it's with soft multifocals, ortho K, or me medical therapy. I think it would be wise for us to have in mind a, a target axial length so that at six months or a year, we can see if we're meeting our target axial length control. And if we're not, then perhaps we need to do additive therapy. Perhaps we need to add atropine to our contact lens correction or vice versa to get an enhanced effect because what we're doing isn't meeting our target axial length goals for that patient. Um, so adding a second line. Again, measuring axial length is necessary to determine the risk of associated pathology for an individual patient. That child who you're about to begin therapy on, if they are, again, a, a, a 26 millimeter eye versus a 23 millimeter eye, that's important in your consideration and how aggressive you should be. It predicts the risk for myopia development for any individual patient. And again, it's useful to evaluate the effectiveness of myopia management therapies. So this is um, so my take home tonight is um, if you really want to do high level myopia management, axial length measurement, um, axial length measurements are really part of a key part of that equation. And if you have questions, again, we'll take them all at the end. So I'll turn it over now to John, I believe. Great. Thanks, Jason. Great presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to bring on our next presenter. Uh, Dr. John Gellis is the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division at the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute Hearst Vision Group and is CLEI Center for Keratoconus, a subspecialty clinic dedicated to research and treatment of keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. His clinical work is dedicated exclusively to specialty contact lenses and surgical co-management for keratoconus, corneal disorders, ocular surface disease, and post-surgical corneal conditions. He's a sub-investigator for multiple keratoconus-specific clinical trials. And again, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box. We have a, a bunch of great questions already. Uh, John, take it away. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I think... You know, Jason's talk really runs nicely into my talk. Uh, what we're really going to talk about is why uh, corneal tomography, specifically with the Oculus Panicam, 
uh, is important and why every myopia manager needs to know how to use corneal tomography and how they may catch keratoconus prior to initiating treatment with uh, orthokeratology. So I have some disclosures that are relevant. I got some people that I have to acknowledge here, which are Dr. Peter Hirsch, Dr. Stephen Greenstein, and Dr. David Chu from uh, the center. Uh, so let's talk about keratoconus for a moment. You know, we all know what keratoconus really is. It's a uh, bilateral, asymmetric, clinically non-inflammatory disease of the cornea, which is really caused by a loss of biomechanical strength, which leads to uh, focal thinning, steepening, and irregular corneal topography. Now, the classical onset is typically around the uh, second decade of life, so in the teenage years, and it typically progresses up until about the fourth decade of life when it generally stops. Now, early and late stage progression is uncommon, but it does happen. And when we look at the literature, the classic prevalence of this has been reported as one in 2,000 individuals. But that data was derived from a Rabinowitz article that was published back in 1999, which those numbers were derived from a Kennedy study, which was published back in 1986 which was a 48-year uh, clinical epidemiologic study on keratoconus that was done by diagnostic factors such as uh, slit lamp findings and retinoscopy. Um, so that used classical instrumentation to derive that number. Now, most recently, uh, in 2017, 2019, these papers came out uh, from the Netherlands and from New Zealand, respectively, showing numbers of one out of 375 individuals and one out of 191 individuals. Now that difference is really attributed to using advanced diagnostic instruments and the diagnostic instruments that they use in these centers are corneal tomographers, which is what the Pentacam is. So we all know the progressive impact of keratoconus as the cornea becomes more severe in the degree of keratoconus the decrease in the visual acuity happens because of the higher order aberrations that are present. As you can see in those uh, visual simulations there, what we did was correct the lower order aberrations corresponding with the corneas. And you can see as we get worse in the keratoconus, we have more and more uh, effect of those higher order aberrations. And we all know the advanced slit lamp findings. These are things that we're all very aware of, nothing that we really need to go over here. Um, but the management of keratoconus has changed in the United States, and that really happened with the approval of uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. Uh, our center led the, uh, the clinical trial uh, to, to that approval. Now, really what that's changed us to, putting the emphasis on diagnosing the disease as early as possible, stopping progression with corneal collagen cross-linking, and then visually rehabilitating the individual, whether by surgical means or specialty contact lenses, and then monitoring that individual often for, uh, for changes, and then avoiding our, uh, our penetrating keratoplasties. So really what this is saying is we need to diagnose this as early as possible, which means that we need to differentiate a normal cornea from early keratoconus. What we really need to do is be able to lower our threshold for testing, use a combined data approach to be able to improve our ability of diagnosing keratoconus and monitor more often for progression of the disease. Now, when we look at this, there are actionable structural corneal metrics that we want to track in keratoconus. And specifically, we're looking at two structural components the curvature of the cornea and those curvature factors and the thickness of the cornea or the pack imagery. So when we talk about diagnosing early and monitoring often, we need to look at the tools that we use for this. And first, the tool that we're all very familiar with is placido-based corneal topography. Now, what does corneal topography cover in these actionable metrics? Well, placido-based corneal topography covers anterior elevation and curvature, and that's about it. So when we look at this, and these images here, these beautiful maps are actually stolen from the Pentacam, 
<laughs> but they're serving the purpose of looking at specifically at anterior corneal curvature, okay? The metrics that we're looking at here are things like mean keratometry. So, for example, here you can see that our mean keratometry on this individual is 45 diopters, or 44.5 diopters. Uh, their maximum keratometry value is 54.2 diopters. Their IS ratio, which is a measurement of asymmetry from the top to the bottom of the cornea at a six millimeter optic zone, is about 13.3 diopters. And then their axis skew, which is the difference between the major meridians of the astigmatism on the cornea, is about 45 degrees. So when we look at the established metrics, and these metrics have been established for a long time, these were done in the late 80s and early 90s uh, from Obinowitz and Kleiss's groups here. But what you can see here is that those metrics, keratometry values being greater than 47 diopters, IS ratios greater than 1.4 diopters, or axis skew greater than 20 diopters if there is more than 1.4 diopters of uh, keratometric sill present are all very established metrics for this. But when we look at corneal topography that's placido-based, we need to recognize that what we're looking at is really Meyer irregularity. And the limitations here are that it's only measuring the anterior corneal curvature and that this technology is reflection-based. So as you can see, on those individuals with poor tear film quality, they're getting broken and distorted Myers. So if we take a look at these individuals here, you can see the normal cornea on the left, the keratic conus cornea in the middle there, but then you can see this cornea off to the right. Now that individual actually doesn't have keratic conus like that map would suggest. It's actually tremendous amounts of dry eye that's there with a, a corresponding amount of SPK on the cornea that's creating a keratoconic-like shape. That individual is actually the same cornea as the cornea on the left-hand side, that normal cornea there. That normal cornea image was taken a year after that with aggressive dry eye therapy. So when you look at this, the anterior corneal curvatures can be a, a bit of a fallacy because of the uh, lack of metrics that are coming from the total cornea. So that's where corneal tomography comes in and, and the oculus pentacam. So what does corneal tomography do? Well, it takes care of all of these structural measurements. It's looking at curvature of the anterior and posterior cornea, as well as the total global corneal pack imagery of the cornea. So how does tomography work? Well, tomography works by taking slices of a uh, of a image and basically puts them all back together to create a three-dimensional shape. So just like how a CT scan works, where we're taking slices of the, in this instance, the skull, uh, what we're doing in our application to the cornea is we're taking slices of the cornea, and then we're putting them all back together to be to be able to create various different models here. So we can take a look at full corneal metrics with this device. We're able to get anterior elevation and curvature, posterior elevation and curvature, thickness, and corneal densitometry, which is a measurement of corneal clarity. So we all know the anterior corneal curvature maps. This is the axial curvature map that we're seeing here. This is what we're all very familiar with. Um, down below, we're seeing a global pack imagery map, which allows us to see where the thinnest point is of the cornea. Over here, what I'm going to show you is on a normal cornea, uh, a anterior elevation map here and a posterior elevation map here. And what you can see is elevation maps are essentially putting best fit spheres through the cornea. So if we put a best fit sphere through that anterior cornea, we have no portion of that cornea that's popping through the best fit sphere. Same thing with the back surface of the cornea here. You can see that that aligns very nicely with the curvature of that normal cornea. However, when we look at an irregular cornea, you can see we get these hot spots here. So why are those hot spots created? Well, they are created because we've now put a best fit sphere through the anterior cornea, and you can see how the, uh, the peak of that keratoconic cornea is popping up through that best fit sphere. 
And you can see on the back surface that the back surface of the cornea is popping up through that best fit sphere, best fit, best fit sphere uh, even more exaggerated. So that's where you can really get a good look at the metrics of these corneas. You can see that any sort of those hot spot elevations should be pathognomonic for keratoconus. Just like your, uh, your anterior curvature has that hot red spot, so will your elevation maps as well. And your elevation map on your posterior side will be more extreme in comparison to the elevation map on the anterior side. Now also taking a look at a map of corneal densitometry, this is an individual with keratoconus prior to having corneal collagen cross-linking. As we all know, corneal collagen cross-linking will increase the corneal haze that's present and it's most exaggerated at the one month mark and then returns to baseline at about the six to 12 month mark. So you can see this individual at their baseline. I want you to go ahead and take a look at this map here. This is really the corneal densitometry or how clear the cornea is at this baseline measurement. When we go ahead and take a look at the one month post-op measurement, you can see that our densitometry has changed we've now become more opaque in the cornea. And you can see that by the raised, uh, the raised values in the metrics of corneal clarity there. Now, when we follow this individual out at the two year mark, you can see that their cornea values now drop back down to the normal values of what we would have seen before they had the procedure. So this is a, a incredibly useful metric and was what we used in a lot of the papers that came out of our clinic. Now, to talk about posterior cornea, because this is new to some individuals who haven't used tomography before, um, they, they are several studies on this, but the most important one is the uh, Mihal uh, study here, which looked at uh, differentiating uh, keratoconus from normal eyes or early keratoconus from normal eyes and what they found was a cutoff of 15.5 microns of posterior corneal elevation was 95% sensitive and 94% specific for the diagnosis of keratoconus. Now, when we look at corneal thicknesses, uh, Yuktan's group out of, uh, I believe, Turkey uh, looked at normal versus keratoconus as well and found that a corneal thickness less than 497 microns was the second most predictive factor in differentiating normal corneas from corneas with keratoconus. Now, the other thing to make mention of is the location of the thinnest point, which you can see here, is not located in the central cornea like what you would have on a normal cornea. You can see that it's located in the uh, inferior temporal portion of the cornea, which is more uh, what we would see in an individual with keratoconus. Now, in the Pentacam, we're able to look at corneal spatial profiling. So taking a look at the thickness profile and comparing that to a normal database, you can see up top, the corneal thickness spatial profile is looking at how the cornea becomes thicker or thinner from the periphery of the cornea to the central uh, portion of the cornea and mapping that against a normative database. Now, the percent thickness increase is also another way of checking out the rate of thickness change from the central cornea to the peripheral cornea and comparing that to a normal normative database. So what we're going to go through right now is what kind of a normal cornea looks like. So you can see on these graphs here that cornea is within the normal thicknesses and the normal rate of change there. You can see that those red lines are within those normative databases. Now, when you take a look at a keratoconic eye, you can see that they are significantly thinner in the, uh, in the spatial thickness on the superior map there, and they are outside of the rate of change in the, uh, of the normal normative database on the graph on the bottom. Now, what gets interesting is what do we do with somebody like this? This is kind of a keratoconic suspect. They have generally normal corneal thickness, but you can see that their rate of corneal thickness change is abnormal. It falls outside of that normal spatial range. Well, now what we want to do is take multiple metrics together and take a look at them all to be able to uh, early, make an earlier diagnosis factor 
of keratoconus in an individual. So taking into account the anterior and posterior curvature of a cornea with uh, of a cornea, and taking a look at the uh, corneal thickness profiling, what we get is what Pentacam has created, uh, or, or the Oculus people have created for the Pentacam, called the Bell and Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia Display. What this does is actually enhance the uh, the best fit sphere over a cornea by creating a best fit sphere that aligns to the peripheral cornea. And that way, the ectatic portion of the cornea is popping through that best fit, best fit sphere in a more in, uh, per, protruded way. So when you, we create all these values together, all the metrics, we're using the thickness plus the anterior and the posterior elevation, what we get is what they call a D value. And a D value greater than one is what they consider abnormal. Now, when we look at the enhanced ectasia display, we can see that this was actually an incredibly sensitive and incredibly specific uh, way of measuring this, uh, of measuring uh, corneas and differentiating them from uh, normal corneas. Uh, or differentiating uh, early keratoconus from normal corneas. So let's run through a couple of examples here. This is an individual with a normal cornea. You can see that the posterior and anterior elevations are totally normal. The spatial thicknesses and everything are within the normative databases. We can see in this individual with severe keratoconus, they have a D value of 26. You can see that that individual has grossly abnormal elevation uh, changes on the posterior and anterior cornea, and they have significant changes that put them outside of the normative databases on the thickness uh, and rate uh, graphs here. You can see on this individual, though, this is where things get interesting. This individual has no changes on the anterior surface of their cornea. On their posterior cornea, they have a very early change, but when we put it in enhanced best fear, best fit, best fit sphere through that posterior cornea, we can see that we have even more uh, ectasia present there, which is showing us that that is significantly abnormal. Now, when we go over here, the thickness profile is generally normal, but we fall outside on the rate. But what we can see is that a D value of four is derived, telling us that this is abnormal. This is an individual who may have early keratoconus. Now, on this individual as well, we can see that there are no gross elevation changes here, but they do have uh, a thinner than average cornea, and you can see that that individual does not quite meet the criteria for having a greater than one value that would make them an abnormal cornea. This is an individual who simply just has a thinner than average cornea not keratoconus. So now that was all about diagnosing. Now, how do we monitor uh, keratoconus? Now, they have a tremendous piece of equipment in this called the ABCD progression analysis. And what that's doing is taking in a, into account multiple factors together and mapping those out over time. So what you're taking is the, the thinnest point on the cornea and mapping out a three millimeter uh, ring around that area, and you're comparing anterior cornea or corneal curvature to and posterior corneal curvature uh, to that, uh, that corneal thickness portion. And what we're doing is we're deriving values after that. Now the D portion of this is visual acuity, which is a subjective measurement that you would enter in. But what you can see on this individual over time we can see that the yellow bars there are their baseline, uh, excuse me, are their, um, their original scans here. So you can see that's their baseline scans. Now in the green there, you can see that this individual in a three month period of time on their anterior side has, uh, has increased dramatically in the steepness of the cornea, the posterior as well, and on the, and on the corneal thickness as well. And you can see these intervals that are put into the metrics here. You can see what they're putting in there is a 90 or an 
percent uh, confidence interval and a 95 percent confidence interval to say that a change on this cornea is definitely or probably keratoconus so you can see that this individual those changes are definitely keratoconic changes that are happening so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the application of keratoconus onset and myopia management and why this is so important for us to use a tomographer before we go into myopia management. Well, if we look at this study, this was a, a study uh, published back in 1997. This was the first one to really look at age of onset in individuals with keratoconus. And what they did was they reviewed patients uh, with keratoconus in need of a penetrating keratoplasty. They looked at 74 individuals, and what they found was those 74 individuals had an average onset of keratoconus at, of age 15.3. So those individuals were about 15 years old when they were diagnosed with keratoconus. Now this study, which is much more recent, uh, was a, uh, a review of corneal collagen cross-linking patients uh, in the pediatric population. They looked at a tremendous amount of studies. And what you can see here is in the studies, the age group goes from about age eight up to about age 18. When you looked at the average from all these studies, the average age of onset was again, about 15 years old. So then we look at uh, uh, contact lenses, orthokeratologies, and the pediatric age groups here. When we look at Morgan's uh, study, this was a international survey of orthokeratology contact lens fitting. 45 countries were surveyed, and what they found was 40% of individuals in, in orthokeratology were fit under the age of 18. Now, when we looked at SINCE study, which was a review of of when, or when practitioners introduced patients, what age did they introduce patients to contact lenses? What they found was the vast majority were introduced to contact lenses at about age 10 to 12. And we all know that myopia and its progressive age range is progressing the most at around that teenage years. So what we can see here is that the individuals who we are using myopia control or myopia management uh, uh, strategies for and the individuals that we're fitting with orthokeratology are all in the same age group of the individuals who develop keratoconus. Now, specifically, if we're using orthokeratology, orthokeratology reshapes the anterior corneal surface. And if you're using a corneal topography that uses a placido disc, that's only measuring the anterior corneal surface. So if you're only using that, you're manipulating your only factor that you would be able to use to diagnose keratoconus early. So what this is saying is essentially you need corneal tomography to be able to rule out keratoconus prior to your fitting by and as well as monitoring this over time because now instead of having to rely on anterior corneal curvature for the changes that would happen, you're able to look at the posterior cornea and the pachymetric changes to follow that cornea over time. So this is why you need that corneal tomographer or well, like it's pentakin. So I'm gonna go ahead and run through a very quick case here. This is an individual we saw in April 2017, a 16-year-old Caucasian female, unremarkable corneal history, unremarkable medical history. She has uh, myopia with a little bit of astigmatism. We're gonna focus only on her right eye here. Her right eye is 20-20 uh, with uh, a very minimal prescription. Now, when we look at her corneal topography, not really much here that's of all that concern. Uh, this is a tangential map. You can see this individual has Ks of 42.25 by 43.25. Nothing really out of the ordinary there. However, when we put her on the pentacam, what we can see is that she has a anterior elevation of about 8 microns. On the uh, thickness map, she has a thinnest point of 492 microns. And when we look at the back surface, again, she also has an abnormal elevation on that back surface. Not quite to that 15 micron level, though, but all these factors are starting to come together to a point where we're going, 
there is some asymmetry from top to bottom of the cornea. Well, this is kind of a keratoconus suspect. Given her age, we're going to see her back in three months. So we see her back in three months. There are no changes there. When we look at her corneal uh, maps uh, or curvature maps, there's really no changes there. So we're saying no changes. She's still a suspect. We're going to follow up again in three months. Well, she's lost a follow up. We see her 18 months later in May of 2019. She says her vision is changing in her right eye. She's getting ready to leave for college soon. Her visual acuity has decreased. She's only able to correct to 2025. And lo and behold, what we see here is that she does clearly have signs of keratoconus. Her anterior elevation is now at uh, 10 microns. Her posterior elevation is now at 23 microns. Her thickness is now at 485 microns. Overall, when we look at the changes over time, we can see that she has increased in corneal curvature by 2.1 diopters. She's lost thickness of about seven diopters, or excuse me, seven microns. And when we look at her changes over time, she is clearly meeting that 95% confidence interval for being a individual who has progressed in keratoconus. So what do we see here? She has keratoconus. She needs corneal collagen cross-linking ASAP. So this individual, had we have fit them with a orthokeratology lens, and we may have felt relatively comfortable with that based on the corneal topography, the placido ring corneal topography alone, we would have uh, you know, covered up and masked that corneal curvature. And then we would have been able to work with the posterior elevation and the thickness to be able to diagnose this individual um, over time by using uh, corneal tomography. So in summary, we want to be prepared, screen the whole cornea prior to treatment, monitor the whole cornea even during treatment, catch keratoconus early, and take action with corneal collagen cross-linking. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Mal. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, let me introduce Ken. Uh, we bring up his slides. Dr. Ken Mahler earned his OD degree from the Illinois College of Optometry. He immediately entered private practice and currently is in private solo practice in Fort Lauderdale. He's participated as a clinical investigator for multiple studies regarding contact lenses and solutions. He's published many articles and authored the first wave contact lens designer certification program and has lectured extensively. Again, if you have questions either for John, uh, or as Ken's going through, type them up in the chat room and we'll get to them all at the end. Take it away, Ken. Thank you very much, Gary. Okay, my talk tonight's a little bit different than uh, both Jason's and uh, John's. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, CSP software on the Pentacam, the Wave software, and its approach to uh, sclerals and how this um, all can really elevate your um, scleral lens practice uh, uh, up above uh, the uh, traditional uh, pre-made types or semi-customized types of designs of sclerals that are available. Uh, Ortho-K, I am going to be actually doing a talk tomorrow on Ortho-K, so if anyone's interested, uh, please tune in again tomorrow, same time. Okay, now for some reason, there we go. All right, first on the uh, introduction here, my disclosures, uh, this is a little bit about what I do. And uh, I have a lot of material to get to here as well. So you can read this at your leisure another time uh, if you're actually interested in all this. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about the Pentacam. So what is it? Uh, as uh, John had just talked about, it is a um, uh, corneal uh, tomographer and it's a, it takes its measurements through a rotating shine fluid camera. Uh, down at the bottom there, you see the three types of models that are available, the basic AXL and the HR. Uh, and they do have uh, different uh, applications that are available on them. Uh, and for the purposes of the CSP and the WAVE software that I'm going to be talking about with application to uh, scleral design, the AXL does not apply here. So it's only the basic and the HR would be um, appropriate for uh, that type of use. Uh, as we just saw earlier on the uh, pictures, it does do corneal topography and tomography, and it does image actually the anterior segment as well. So let's get to the CSP and what, what is it? Well, it's the corneal scleral profiling uh, software 
package that's added on to the uh, uh, Pentacam uh, basic and HR models. And down at the uh, graphic below there, you can see uh, that screen uh, divided up into a couple of different segments there. On the left-hand side, you see the uh, arcs. There are 25 of those arcs there. Uh, on the lower right, you actually see the images that were taken. Uh, the one in the middle is the one of the central cornea. The one down at the bottom where you have both on the left and right side is actually showing uh, out at the limbus uh, and out onto the sclera. And up at the top part of this screen here, uh, in the upper right there, that uh, multicolored uh, graphic there is showing a coverage map. So when you're taking these pictures, you want to have a sense of how much of the uh, measured area are you actually uh, you know, capturing in the, um, in the scan. Uh, let's move on here. Uh, this is uh, another screen over here, and we can see that coverage map up on the left there. Uh, basically, it's divided into five segments, and that's because you take on each eye five scans. Uh, the segments are the central gray area, which is basically the central cornea, uh, and then you have the green, red, blue, and purple uh, representing superior, inferior, nasal, and temporal uh, quadrants, respectively. Now, on the right-hand side, the large graphic, uh, the uh, best fit sphere is used as a reference for both the cornea and the sclera, and you see it gives two values up there. Uh, for the cornea, it's using on this particular scan an 8.3 millimeter radius uh, uh, surface, and then for the sclera, 10.5, because obviously the uh, scleral uh, dimensions are considerably flatter, so it uses a much flatter sphere. So let's go on to the actual specifics of what we're looking at here. So those 25 profile arcs, those are the actual slices that are taken uh, 360 degrees around the dimension of the uh, cornea. Uh, and you can see that it's also color coded. Uh, the central section of the arcs is all gray because that is the central cornea. Down at the bottom there, you can see a cord measurement and you can see that the uh, gray pretty much ends up at about uh, between 11 and 12 uh, millimeter cord. Uh, and then you have each of the four quadrants, the red, green, uh, blue, and purple. And in the, uh, in the corners of each one of those parts of the screen, you can see the I, S, N, and T to tell you exactly which one you are, um, wh which one you're actually looking at. Now, there's also one red arc. That's the actual arc that you're measuring. And you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, number 19 has a, uh, rectangle around it, and that's because that's the 19th arc there, and that's just highlighted. Now, when you do a mouse over on this particular screen, and you can see I did that at about a 14 millimeter cord, a bunch of numbers pop up on each one of those measured arcs. And I just went ahead and blew those up a little bit so you can see what they actually look like. And in the superior uh, quadrant on the sclera, uh, we can see that the top value is uh, 3,361 microns. And over here at the bottom on the temporal quadrant, uh, we could see the bottom value there is 3,674 microns. So at a 14 millimeter cord, we are seeing there about a 300 micron difference in scleral elevation uh, between the uh, superior and temporal uh, quadrants. Now, it also outputs uh, certain information in, in these um, uh, screens over here. And I've summarized them out on the right with this uh, table labeled superior temporal, inferior, and nasal. Uh, the uh, cross that you see uh, is essentially the principal uh, meridians, just like you would think of an optical cross. These are the principal meridians for the actual curvatures. And what it's giving you at those um, uh, respective uh, semi-meridian markings is it's giving you the sagittal depth, it's giving you the angle that the sclera is um, uh, sort of flattening out at there. And what we can see over here, this is at a uh, diameter of 15 millimeters, we can see that the dimensions are considerably different as well as the angular approaches are very different. Now this is really why if you're fitting uh, rotationally symmetrical lenses or spherical lenses and non-torics, this is why sometimes you can see uh, one part of the flange of the lens actually lines up pretty nicely while the other part is really digging in or actually elevating way off of the sclera. 
sclera. And you can see this is even at a core to 15 millimeters, whereas a lot of the scleral designs are much larger than that. Now at 17 millimeters, it also gives us, or 17.1 millimeters, it gives us an average sagittal depth of 4,794 microns. But here I've gone ahead and put the um, uh, ring diameter out to 16.3 millimeters. So comparing the 15 millimeter cord out to 16.3, we can see that there's actually considerably larger differences between the different quadrant areas that are being measured. Uh, from certainly from 38 degrees to 46 degree angle, that's that's considerably different, and that is going to impact how your lens lands on that particular area. Now, next, it generates out a sagittal map matrix. Now, unless your vision is incredibly good, you really can't see what that oval looks like. So I've gone ahead and blown up a little section of it over here, and you can see it's actually a spreadsheet. And making that a little bit larger, this is actually the data that's being collected by the CSP software. So that oval that's up on the top is actually the cornea and scleral data out all the way to the furthest point measurement measured, and we can see the respective uh, sagittal depth at all of those given points. And you can see it actually is a wealth of information there. Uh, quite honestly, it's a, a lot of minutiae there. Uh, certainly to manage that uh, manually would be very, very difficult, which is why they summarize that with the semi-meridian uh, uh, principle, principles that we've seen on the screen prior. So now let's get to WAVE. WAVE manages that data considerably better. This is a uh, graphic that I prepared here and it's animated so we can see in the upper right hand corner that green uh, fluorescein uh, map on the uh, the uh, quad display over there. You can see that the radar is going around and uh, the uh, uh, screen there uh, 360 degrees and stopping at each of the 45 degree semi meridians. And as that is happening we can see what's going on on the left-hand side of the screen here. So let's take a look and break this down just a little bit so people who aren't familiar with WAVE can understand what we're actually looking at. On the uh, upper half of the left side of the screen that's labeled lens, sclera, and cornea, you can see I've drawn some arrows there. Now the bottom arrow uh, that's labeled cornea is pointing to that green line that's at the bottom of the uh, graphic. And that green line is actually the reference surface. Now that reference surface is a straight line because WAVE has done a very, very nice job of taking all of that sagittal data and representing it instead of a curve as a single straight line. It's easier for us to think in those terms when we're referencing that, that curved surface there. Now, as the radar screen is spinning around, the straight line doesn't change because the straight line is just a straight line, but the sagittal depths are changing considerably. And so what that's telling you is that the black line, which is the one I have labeled lens, is changing in relation to the green line by the amount of area that is underneath that particular black line curve. So in each area, we can see that the uh, black and the green line, for the most part on this, on this um, uh, particular lens that I've designed between the two red vertical lines is not changing a whole great uh, amount. And that's because I have the sagittal depth uh, fairly consistent between the back of the lens and the front of the uh, cornea. But if you take a look at the peripheral areas, which I've labeled on this sclera, and it's kind of where that pink ball is bouncing up and down on both sides over there, you can see that's changing considerably. And the reason for that is when I've designed up this lens, I've changed the relationship of how I want that lens to act with the particular scleral data that's happening out on the flange. On the bottom half of this uh, screen, we can see uh, in the upper right of the yellow graphic there, the sagittal value is changing dramatically. Uh, here in the uh, inferior, well, it just, it just passed by there, but as the um, graphic on the uh, bottom where it says nasal, superior nasal, superior, and so on, you can see that the sag sagittal depth of the lens is changing dramatically. Now, the graphic of the blue arc over the gray arc is showing you how I have this lens particularly aligned on that reference cornea and scleral surface. Now that's just not a pretty graphic, but that scleral and corneal reference surface was generated from that sagittal 
map matrix that we just saw on the previous page. So that is that is the actual sagittal depth that's represented by this graphic. And you can see as it's spinning around a little bit that some of the area out on the sclera is bouncing up and down. My arrows don't move, but you can see the gray portion of what's labeled sclera is actually bouncing up and down a little bit as the sagittal depth changes. Uh, the blue graphic of the lens is the actual data that's sent to the lathe to cut the lens. So that's, again, just not a pretty graphic, but that is the actual relationship between what the lens is that I've designed for this particular eye and in relation to that very specific corneal uh, dimension that and scleral dimension that was measured directly from the uh, Pentacam CSP software. So to understand what wave is, it, corneal scleral surfaces are not rotationally symmetrical, and the e-values value, e vary along each of the radii. And so WAVE goes ahead and divides the 360 degrees of the cornea into 24 15-degree pi wedge radial segments. So we think in terms of these semi-meridians going around the clock dial 360 degrees. Uh, each of those 15-degree wedges are divided further into 88 zones from the center out to the periphery of the lens. And by using the topography of the patient as a guide, WAVE gives you the power as the designer to control each of those 88 zones of the 15 degree pi wedge segments. WAVE then takes care of the math to make sure each one of your segments will connect up so you have a continuous surface, both on the front and the back of the lens. So I've created a graphic over here. And on this graphic, you could see if we had a monocurve lens, a, think of a single radius, let's say a, seven, uh, a sphere of 7.50 uh, millimeter radius, red would represent that as a single sphere and that would be a single curve. What WAVE goes ahead and does is it takes that lens and it divides that into the 24 pi wedge segments that are each 15 degrees. So what I've done on this uh, graphic here is you could see each of the 45 degree semi-meridians and then between zero and 45, I've divided that into two more, uh, by two more uh, line segments. So we have three 15 degree uh, wedges that are created there. Uh, in that lower, between zero and 15 degrees, I went ahead and created that striated area. So you could see that we have the red and the white striations, and there's a total of 88 of them there. And WAVE is giving you control of each one of those segments over the entire dimension of this lens, both on front and back surface of the uh, lens. And so to do some quick math here, basically you've got a little over 2,000 areas of that lens that are under control when you're using the WAVE software. You can then go ahead and align much better the back surface to the front surface of the cornea and the sclera, which was data that you collected directly from the patient. The uh, uh, lens uh, that's being designed in uh, WAVE, uh, the software already understands exactly what is going on on the back surface when you're trying to align that lens with the uh, uh, corneal and scleral surface, and so it, it calculates out what the compensatory power needs to be for the equivalent area on the front of the lens. So this type of construction of the lens can be used to generate basically all types of rigid lens designs, corneal, scleral, multifocal, ortho -K, toric, whatever you can think of. And when you think about designing these lenses, you really move away from designing rotationally symmetrical uh, curvatures, but you really think in terms of tier layer clearances. So you think about how much of the lens you want off of the cornea slash scleral surface and by how many microns, and then you design that area of the lens. So let's take a look at a case presentation. This here was a post uh, LASIK eye. It was a right eye. And on the left, you can see my arcs over there that were collected by the uh, CSP data. Uh, and on the right, I just summarized the scleral parameters that were uh, output by the CSP data. And we can see at the 15 9 millimeter uh, cord uh, that we don't have sphericity and we do not have regulatoricity. Uh, we actually have very, very different values. Uh, we could see the slope of the curve has changed from uh, 37 degrees to 44 degrees. A seven degree change is considerable. And we could see the sagittal depths are different by about 300 microns there. 
So on this, I designed up a wave lens. And in this one, I did summarize down at the bottom of the screen there, the wave sagittal uh, depths that I created for this particular lens. And you can see how they're varying as the radar screen is spinning around the dimension of this lens. So this was the lens that we had just been looking at. It's a 16 millimeter lens. And you can see that rotationally, it's very asymmetrical so that it has a flange that really does uh, create a very constant relationship with the underlying scleral uh, dimension that was measured right off of the uh, CSP software. We can also see the sagittal depth varies on this lens from 4260 uh, up to 4700. And so we're looking at almost a half a millimeter difference in terms of the sagittal depth of this lens in its uh, two greatest uh, areas of elevation uh, and depression. I did summarize this over here. It's not really all that important that you see it. It was just I, I was comparing uh, what the scleral parameters were with the lens parameters, and then what the differences were uh, in those uh, principal meridians. And we could see where the uh, differences uh, ranged uh, from almost directly in line at the 14 microns uh, up to about 287 microns of difference. And that had to do with fitting uh, concerns. This is the second case that I put together here for us, and this was a post-traumatic eye. Uh, once again, at the 15.3 millimeter cord, we can see here that we have considerable differences both on the angle of the uh, sclera as well as the sagittal depths. And even at the 15.3, uh, dimension. This is definitely not spherical, and it is, again, not regular toric. Uh, these are really asymmetric uh, shapes that are being measured here. It measured the average sagittal depth at 16 millimeters to be 4,103 uh, microns. And if we take a look here at my 16 millimeter lens, uh, it's considerably different on my lens design, and you could see it's varying all the way from 3,600 uh, to 4,500. That's nearly a millimeter difference of sagittal depth on this particular lens uh, and how the uh, flanges are lining up with this particular sclera that's bouncing up and down as we go around the lens design. Once again, I just compared those two. I just read those manually right off of the uh, data that was, uh, that it was, uh, was put out there. And so in conclusion, I just want to summarize what's really going on here. The CSP software provides sagittal data to accord reliably out to 16 and a half millimeters. Um, I have to say that as I've gotten better at getting scans, I'm pretty comfortable at getting out to about 17 millimeters uh, reliably. Sometimes the architecture of the uh, orbital structures can really get in the way, and it's very, very difficult sometimes to get the scan out that far. The captured data, though, that we um, uh, do catch with the uh, CSP provides us a virtual model of the cornea and sclera, and within WAVE, this is now used as a reference surface to design the lens from. Once we have that captured data, we can then use either the um, principal points to use fixed designed sclerals, as long as you have the sagittal depths of that lens that you're using at those given cords. But if you're using WAVE, you can use that specific reference surface directly and then design the lens to be just as complex as the underlying surfaces. Uh, what the CSP cannot do is it cannot account for the spongy factor of conjunctival tissue. And so that does vary things. And that's why you do have to build in, build in a certain uh, value uh, to deal with how much the lens is going to sink into the spongy conjunctiva. Um, and then, of course, once you have all these sagittal measurements at pretty much all of these cords, uh, 16 and a half millimeters, even out to 17, and I have gotten even out to 17 and a half millimeters, in all those semi-meridians, you can really either choose a first lens empirically that should fit well, or if you're going to design up a wave lens, design up a lens that will fit exactly what's going on on that particular patient's uh, surface. And I think at this point, we're going to turn the uh, lecture back over to uh, Dr. Thanks, Gerber. Sure thing. Great. Thanks, Ken. Great, great presentations, guys. Uh, uh, for our uh, attendees, the uh, panelists are going to be able to stick around for questions. So we ran over a little bit, but they're uh, they're kind enough to stick around. So if you still have questions, just put them in the chat room. Uh, I'm going to get right to the questions. First, uh, Jason, first couple ones are for you relative to myopia. The first one is, what is the pathogenesis for glaucoma in higher myopes? Mm. <laughs> uh, 
Well, uh, I'm not going to claim to know that entirely, um, but from my perspective, as a um, as someone who's not a specialist in that area, I've got to say that it has to do with um, as the eye is lengthened, there's stretching of tissue. Um, there's uh, there's uh, probably forces and pressure. Uh, again, and I think it's probably just more the the stretching of the tissue, the the, the pressure on the bundles as they tilt and and um, are are pushed into a different configuration than they developed out to be. So um, again, without getting into that too detailed, um, that would be my estimation. Okay. Uh, next one. Uh, this one's probably going to be a little bit easier for you. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's right, right in the myopia sweet spot. Okay. Um, after treatment of myopia, how quickly do you see shortening of the eye? One month, three months, six months, whatever. I mean, we're starting atropine, I presume. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen it happen literally immediately. I uh, meaning um, a lot of times what I'll do is when, after I start someone on atropine therapy, I'll want to have them come back in a week or two, see how they're tolerating it, make sure they're not having any symptoms. Um, you know, of, of photophobia, of accommodative blur, whatever. And um, we'll always do a quick double check of their refractive error at that point. And, and most of the time I see it already in that initial follow-up, just again, a matter of a week or two later. So it happens pretty fast. And then a follow-up question to that exact one is, will atropine also thicken the choroid temporarily, therefore giving a shorter axial length? <sighs> yeah. I that's a great question. Um, and, and again, I don't know the answer for sure. I know that there are studies out there that look at that. And um, and I would say that, you know, again, without, without pulling out publications and verifying that, I'd say there's a pretty good chance that that's spot on. Um, so I think there's something to that. And I, I, definitely, um, I definitely wouldn't say that that's not a possibility. Okay. Ken, I got a question for you. Uh, when would you choose geometrically symmetrical versus free form? Uh, what sag depth difference between the four quadrants? Uh, if the question is for a corneal lens, uh, I typically will design uh, GSIM uh, until I really in, until I really do start to see asymmetry. For scleral lenses, uh, I've abandoned anything but a, a, a totally asymmetric lens. There is no reason to have uh, any uh, areas of compression or elevation. Uh, the goal here is to align the flange uh, properly uh, and uh, equally basically all the way around to support the lens the best and that the best way to do that is with a uh, totally freeform asymmetric lens. So for every scleral lens, even if it's a small diameter as we saw here in the presentation, even in 15 millimeters, there can be a fair amount of asymmetry. I just go ahead and design up a freeform lens. Uh, Jason, you talked about using cycloplegia before measuring axial length. So the question relates to that comment, I believe. Do you recommend measuring axial length in both uh, cycloplegia and not cycloplegia as it relates to, and the questioner puts stretchability in quotes, a stretchability factor, I guess, to get the difference between the two? I think that's a great, I think it's a great thing to do if you can. I think when we talk about doing it under cycloplegia, what we're looking for is consistency from one, one, from the baseline, from one year to the next for monitoring it. I think having it measured under both conditions isn't a bad thing. It, it probably gives you some um, extra data, something better to, or just more information to make judgments on. I, I think there's something to that. Again, that, that's another great point that I didn't really touch on just due to lack of time. But um, every, I mean, I'm firmly believing that everybody's eyes are not the same in terms of stretchability, so to speak, and that some individuals are, are far more prone to, you know, progression of their myopia, partially because their eyes just softer and more malleable. And, and could you see a bigger change in axial length measurements in someone undilated versus dilated um, or prior to atropine versus after starting atropine, would that be an indication that they are at greater risk for progression? I think it's a great question, and I don't think we can say no, and it's probably something that's worth looking at. Hey, John, I don't want you to feel left out. Could you clarify <laughs> the importance of the posterior curvature map over having only an anterior curvature map and a full width 
stoichiometry in detecting keratoconus? Well, well, that that is really the key. So if you look at the, uh, you know, obviously we're we're limited in how much we can go into depth here, but there was a 2015 paper called the uh, Global Consensus uh, on Diagnosis Keratoconus. So essentially, what this was was it was a Delphi panel made up of all the cornea societies across the world. So pan cornea, U cornea. Uh, cornea Society, a ACRS, all these cornea societies, all of them got together to be able to come up with a consensus on what defines um, a change in keratoconus, a progression in keratoconus, right? Um, so it was on corneal lactation. So essentially what they said was that anterior corneal curvature factors are not enough to diagnose this. What you need to look at is pachymetry changes, posterior elevation changes, as well as changes to the rates of, uh, of thickness changes in these individuals. And you need to be able to follow those metrics over time. So if you have two out of the three that change, that uh, constitutes a progression. So essentially what we're looking at is all of these are different factors and you need to bring them all together. So yes, Anterior corneal curvature, if you see a greater than 47 diopter, that's keratoconus. If you see an IS ratio greater than, you know, uh, greater than uh, 1.5 diopters, that's keratoconus. If you see a cornea that's less than 500 microns and it has a posterior elevation of greater than 15 microns, and it has a corneal uh, anterior curvature that's abnormal, all of those together are going to help you diagnose that keratoconus. So the important thing here is to note the individual metrics. So when you have a patient that comes in that may be a candidate for myopia control or orthokeratology, what you're looking at initially, if you're using a posito-based corneal topographer, is just what's going on on the front surface. And many times that may look totally normal. But if you look at the posterior surface and you look at the global pack imagery, you may find that those two factors are abnormal, even though their front surface curvature is normal. And those individuals, you need to be suspicious of keratoconus. And when you use a orthokeratology lens, that orthokeratology lens works by manipulating the anterior corneal shape. It's gentle, it's not gonna harm the eye or anything like that, but it does change the corneal curvature on the front. And if that's your only metric to diagnose keratoconus, then you've eliminated that metric because you've now worked that cornea, right? So you need to use those other two metrics, which is the posterior cornea and the thickness of the cornea to be able to monitor those changes from baseline. Thank you. Uh, Ken? How do you change your scleral lens design to compensate for lens inferior decentration? Great question. Uh, interestingly, uh, the inferior decentration doesn't happen when you have a much, much better aligned flange. And so I don't really see very much of the inferior uh, and or the temporal decentration that you would see with the more rotationally symmetrical or toric type designs. So the answer to that is create a flange that lands evenly all around the eye. And that should take care of a lot of that decentration problem, which by the way, has another benefit in addition to the physical and mechanical problems is it also leaves the optics where they need to be, which is along the visual axis centered. Okay, thank you. Jason, got another tough hypothetical for you. Sure. <laughs> all right, it's a cool question though. Uh, okay. If, if we measured axial length with contact ultrasound B scan with A scan measurement capability, would cycloplegic axial length measurement be not as important since the kid's eye is in a closed eye environment and accommodations not being stimulated? I know it's hypothetical, but do you want to take a stab at it? <clears throat> um, that, was, that was my answer too. A tough yeah, one. no, no, it's it's you have to think about that for a second. I mean, clearly, um, clearly, if the eye is closed, I mean, we assume accommodation is out of the equation, 
but I don't I don't know I don't know if that if that's the case for sure. Certainly, the um, account of accommodative stimulus to get any type of measurable change in axial length isn't just going to happen with a quarter or a half diopter. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be, you know, again, the studies are we're checking two, four, six, or three and six diopter stimulus. Um, so uh, perhaps, I mean, I think that's probably a reasonable thing. You're going to be more accurate in that type of a scenario than it with the eye open, but I still I feel like um, from the perspective of monitoring the patient, I, I probably want them dilated, you know, at least once a year, if not every six months anyway. So why not just do it um, when you have them dilated? All right. Since it's the last question, I'll I'll try to opine a little bit. I can give a practice management perspective on that one, which you touched on well, Jason. The um, I, it's a hypothetical question. I think it's an impossible question because good luck doing con con a contact ultrasound, let alone a scan, on a kid <laughs> reliably, reproducibly. At that point, accommodations out the window anyway, because you'll never be able to do it. So, yeah. and that I mean, that's based on our experience. We've got 15 centers around the country, and we started out with a scan, yeah. uh, and that lasted probably two weeks, and then we yeah. just switched over to an AXL. So yeah, it's just it's not practical anyway. Even if it was true, you can't you can't execute it on a kid. Correct. I, I yeah, I totally agree. There's other factors there that make it just really impractical. Yeah. Uh, that's it, guys. Thank, thanks for uh, sticking around uh, and you know, kind of getting to all the questions. Uh, to our attendees, uh, th thanks for joining us. A great session, guys, and hope everybody got a lot out of it and you start to use some of this stuff, planning for your post-COVID reopening or making your practices mm -hmm. even better. And thanks again, everybody. Have a great night.